Well, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's always nice to be back at Cambridge. Uh, I was realising as I sat here, I first sat in these rooms nearly 25 years ago, uh, which is terrifying. Um, I'm a patent litigation partner at Freshfields, um, but I also do some competition law. Uh, saying that to people tends to make a lot of IP lawyers look at you like you say, say you live in a Brexit area and speak a foreign language. Um, and, and I got a similar warning from the organisers saying, remember most of the audience are, are IP lawyers, they won't understand much competition law. Um, that, 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 that seems a bit like the, the warning Stephen Hawking got when he wrote his book of uh, every time you put in an equation you'll have the sales of your book. Uh, we've already had chemistry up on board but that's okay for our, our IP lawyers. Um, so this is all I'm doing in competition law. Hopefully that doesn't terrify too many of you. Um, and it doesn't really matter uh, for most purposes because what we're looking at in, in these cases is really the anti-competitive piece of it rather than whether it's an agreement. Uh, the dominant position bit sometimes, sometimes crops up. If that's been really all too much for you, um, the other point to think, just think about is how this market works. We often think about the market in very simple terms that there's the patent owner, they've got their drug, they've got, mon got a monopoly, and then the patent goes and everyone flows into the market and the price crashes and it becomes a commodity product. That's kind of our simplified view of it and that, 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 that's what we, we often talk about in the patents court when we look at preliminary injunction cases. Um, it's not always quite like that. If you are a generic company, yes, you can make a bit of money like that, but you can make a hell of a lot more money if you are the only generic company to come into the market rather than one of many, many ones. Um, Teva, and I always forget it, Teva used the term uh, first and alone. Uh, they want to be first and alone, the, the first and alone generic company. Um, I'm afraid I always think of Chesney Hawks with that. Uh, th those are the right vintage, and maybe Professor Bentley can tell me why I think of Chesney Hawks with first and alone. I was checking you're paying attention. <laughs> The one song, his one famous song being One and Only. Um, but that's, so if, if the competition stuff's too much, just remember Chesney Hawks, One and Only, that's what actually most generic companies want. They want to be the one and only generic company in the market because then they can make some, some, some real money. Um, but what are the competition topics we're looking at? Well, I, I, I bucketed them into three real types. There's the patented drugs where there's settlements, pay for delay. There's other patented drugs issues, there, which are discounts and, and, and then some other related issues. And then there's the off-patent drugs where we see price rises or the price gouging cases. And they're really quite different, but they often get merged again, uh, particularly if you're an IP lawyer and don't like competition law. It, it's all kind of competition-y stuff. But I'm trying, trying, to, trying to split them into these, uh, these three buckets. Starting off with the settlements, that's what gets people very excited. That gets the headlines. Um, it, 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 it's, it's got pretty boring now. Uh, to be honest, uh, although all the cases are coming through, I'm not sure we're getting very many surprises. The pharma sector inquiry was in 2008, 2009. Uh, and that was with a great fanfare and all the outrageous things that pharmaceutical companies were doing, like having a, a toolkit and life cycle management, all these things that everyone had talked about conferences very openly for dozens of years, uh, but were suddenly secret things that had been found out by the commission. That calmed down in the final report in the pharma sector inquiry, and one of the, bi the, the big issues that was still seen out, uh, as outstanding was uh, pay for delay settlements. So, uh, I, I, and the way that they describe that is a generic company threatens to launch and then settles with the innovator, with the innovator paying them a very large sum of money. And if that wasn't part of a pharmaceutical uh, patented market, I don't think anyone would see a surprise that that was anti competitive. I would like to launch a new market. Here's a large packet of money to not launch in my market. Okay, that'll do. You kind of understand why that might be seen as anti-competitive. Um, the, 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 these cases really then dried up pretty quickly. The, the commission put in monitoring so they had to be notified every year and we rapidly saw those kind of cases falling away. And if we look at the three judgments that are coming up, we've got Servier Generics and, 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 and uh, Generics UK, which is just We've had the judgment, and Lundbeck. All of those were conduct in, in the, the, the early to mid 2000s. It's all pretty old conduct. Yes, we're 2020. That's just a reflection of how fast competition law tends to work. Um, we have had the judgment of the court uh, just before uh, Brexit uh, from the CJAU on the, the 30th of January. 
And that was a pretty clear statement that that kind of reverse payment is typically going to be anti-competitive. There were some wonderful blogs with those involved in the case saying, no, 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 it doesn't really say that. But if you read it, it's pretty clear that's what it says. If it's a very large payment, if there's no explanation beyond paying them to keep off the market, then it's going to be regarded as anti-competitive. And it's a long judgment because it goes through all the very clever arguments the lawyers have come up with to say, well, it's scope of the patent or, or it's this or that. Most of those have been rejected pretty clearly. Uh, and, and that was following the Advocate General's opinion. We do have uh, this week another Advocate General's opinion coming out in, in the Lundbeck case. It's the same Advocate General. So I, I don't want to bet on what the outcome will be, but, it, but, but, but I can't imagine it's going to be a complete reverse turn. Um, and then at some point we'll get the survey judgment. Um, none of those cases really tell us, I think, very much new. Uh, uh, and the, the, the question was, should this conduct be, 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 be regarded as anti-competitive? The US Supreme Court a few years ago told us, well, it's, it's rule of reason. We need to look at the facts. They are looking at the facts, but the, 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 these aren't particularly good facts in most of these cases. So it's hot because it's coming out new, but I don't think we're learning very much new about these ones. The more interesting ones, I think, are, are those in the US at the moment. I, I've mentioned one, and I've got another one to talk about. Baltimore and Abbey is quite interesting because that's a, that's a challenge to Abbey's uh, uh, conduct in trying to restrict uh, uh, entry of competitors for Humira. Humira was the world's biggest, uh, most profitable drug for a number of years, uh, 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 and so big money involved. Lots of the stuff is, is what you would expect in a normal case. What is, I think, interesting is there have been a number of settlements with Humira where entry was allowed in Europe now, effectively, but not for a number of years in the US. And these competition cases, among other things, are challenging that and saying, Doing a settlement where you allow differential entries in different jurisdictions is anti-competitive. That's interesting because that's what most people are doing. In the light of the, um, of, of, of the you cannot pay people to not, not to enter, then a lot of people have been crafting uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction entries. Uh, and I think most people think those are not anti-competitive. But we've got a real challenge in the US saying, well, we'll know they are anti-competitive if, if you do this. Uh, so I think that's a case to watch because that maybe means that a lot of the, the settlements that we're doing now might be at risk if, if that succeeds. I don't think it will, I don't think it should, but if that succeeds, then, then, then some of the, the current approaches we think are okay may not be okay. Um, the other one I think is interesting is uh, Staley and Gilead. Uh, I read a, 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 a dismissal judgment this week. Uh, and in that case, uh, particularly, the, again, there's lots of parts of it. The, the interesting piece, I think, is in relation to a settlement agreement between Gilead and Teva, um, which had uh, most favoured entry and most favoured entry plus uh, clauses. The most favoured entry said, we will give you as good a date for entry as anyone else, so we're not going to let anyone else come in the market before you can. So if we settle with other generic companies, they can come in the same date. Most favoured entry plus said, you know what, we will let you enter first. We won't let any others enter till at least six weeks after you in one case or six months after you in another case. Uh, Gilead uh, sought, sought to get that struck out, saying, well, this dismissed, there's no competition problem here. The court said, well, there might be a competition problem. The most favoured entry, maybe not a problem because we're just ensuring parity with others. Most favoured entry plus where you give uh, the, the Teva uh, the first chance to get into the generic market, the, the, the first and alone they want, that might be competition. So we don't, again, we don't know quite where that goes, but that's, that's another area where we're, we're prodding the edges of, right, we know pay for delay, straightforward, big payment, that's going to be problematic. But even on, on, on uh, allowing early entry, um, if it's jurisdiction by jurisdiction, that's being challenged. If it is allowing one to enter before others, or possibly even promising we will give you as good most favoured nation type, uh, that may be problem problematic. So as a sediment case, that's why I say I don't think they are really so exciting, but there is more, more interesting developments in the US. And the US also led the way with pay, pay, pay for delay. We saw that happen in the US significantly before we saw it happen in Europe. Right, what, what about other cases? Um, I, I, as you can probably tell by the fact I'm speaking too quickly, I grew up in Scotland. Um, 
Uh, and, and as many of you will know, in Scots criminal law, there's uh, three potential pleas you can uh, give if you're, you're accused of a crime, which are obviously guilty, not guilty, and a big boy did it and ran away. <laughs> uh, and those lead to the, the, the formal legal uh, conclusions of not guilty, guilty or not proven. Uh, the first two of these cases I put in the not proven category. Uh, so the, the, in both of them, the Competition, uh, and, uh, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK investigated discount schemes. So where discount schemes are being put in place by a pharmaceutical company with the goal of restricting competition, so would say the CMA. In both those cases, the CMA chickened out and said, well, actually, we're not going to make a finding. In both those cases, they sent a nasty letter saying, but don't do it again. Um, Remicade, we get a bit more because we've got a, a very detailed no grounds for action decision. We know a lot less about the first case. Um, but but, but, but the, there is a nervousness about how discounts work, but particularly the Remicade case is quite interesting because the, the CMA's decision says, well, they tried to use discounts to block entry, but it didn't work. So we're not finding it to, the, we're, we're not taking action because although they tried to do something we didn't like, in fact, it didn't work very well. And I think that rebates and discounts are a really complex area of competition law more generally. Um, these aren't particularly to do with patents or the IP side, um, although with Remicade it was about that, that, that period of products coming off patent. Um, but, but there are real, real complexities. If you're thinking about these schemes, basic work, think about getting some advice and make sure you think about getting advice from an external legal counsel, not from your economists, uh, because otherwise you may end up, uh, your, your documents going in front of the court, which you might not want. Um, the other two cases, I think, are the, 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 the quirkier cases. We had the AstraZeneca case some time ago. Uh, the, the two types of conduct being challenged there were AstraZeneca filing for supplementary protection certificates, which Trevor's talked about a bit. Um, but rather than providing the dates on which the marketing authorizations were granted in some countries, providing the dates on which uh, the product was price approved or reimbursement approved. Um, uh, and the, 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 the criticism seems to be that AstraZeneca, when they did that, didn't say that's what they were doing. They just provided the data in the form and didn't say, we think we're entitled to use the date of pricing and the price of date of reimbursement rather than the date of authorization. Uh, that, that, that went through the courts, and the courts later decided you couldn't use the date of authorization, um, but it was found not to be anti-competitive to have tried to do it. Um, that always seemed to me quite an extreme case. Um, because even if you think that was trying to push the limits of the law, it seems a bit difficult to see why that is actually anti-competitive. And, and there was a lot of concern among the IP world about, well, what's, what's this going to lead to? What it's going to lead to it was the Pfizer case. In the Pfizer case, Pfizer had screwed up uh, and had failed to file some uh, uh, SPCs in certain jurisdictions. Uh, in those jurisdictions, they used a divisional patent then to file the SPCs in the divisional patent. Any IP lawyer looks at that and thinks, well, fine, what's wrong with that? Don't see what the problem is. Uh, the Italian competition authorities investigated and said that was anti-competitive because you're trying to block competitors. Yes, that's what patents and SPCs do. There's nothing very weird about that. Went up and appealed. The appeal court said, rubbish, nonsense. Uh, this is not anti-competitive. Hallelujah, we've got some sense. Went up to the Supreme Administrative Court, who then said, no, 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 the, the, the authority got it right. That's anti-competitive. Really, really hard, I think, for any IP lawyer to understand where the problem is there. Even trying to say, I'm not an IP lawyer, I think competition law. But, but, but that, that, that's challenging. And I think we still have some challenges there, uh, particularly um, with national competition authorities who can take a very strong view of a case, think the conduct is wrong, and therefore go after it. Um, and then we turn to our third bucket, um, where we've got completely off-patent drugs. I think these are some of the most damaging cases for the pharmaceutical industry, and they're not being done by innovators in large part, although you'll notice Pfizer are up at the top on this. They're generally not being done by the innovators, but the innovators get tarnished by these cases coming through. <clears throat> we talk a little bit, a bit about the Pfizer case. Uh, Pfizer, uh, the Pfizer Flynn case was about a very old uh, epilepsy drug called phenytoin, uh, which Pfizer sold as epinitin. Price had gone to next to nothing in the UK market. Pfizer weren't particularly interested in it. Flynn came along and said to Pfizer, you know what, we'll buy that drug off you, and we can put the price up. 
because actually there's not much of a, a competitive market for that. We can put the price up on that. You, you might not want to put the price up because it's part of your, your, your basket of goods and you might not want the, the sort of response uh, from, the, from uh, the authorities if you put the price up, but no one knows who we are. We'll whack the price up. The, the, the documents and the decision are, are fascinating on that. Um, and that's what happened. Flynn bought the drug off Pfizer in the UK, whacked the price up massively, um, uh, NHS got very upset, CMA investigated, CMA found out competitive conduct, uh, both by Pfizer and Flynn. Uh, Pfizer were still producing the same drug from the same factory, it still had the name Epinutin on the individual drugs, because it really was the same, the, the same factory, uh, but Pfizer were charging Flynn far, far, far more than they'd been charging the public, and then Flynn were putting their own mark on it, so there, there, was, there was two stages. Um, there was clearly an agreement there, so Article 101, going back to our, our basics of competition law. Um, but the, the CMA went after it as an Article 102 problem, saying this was a, a dominant position um, and uh, that there'd been abuse of that dominant position. And they went after it very strongly. They said, this is clearly terrible conduct. But they really tried to push some points about market definition and also about how much of a high price becomes an abusive price. Uh, and they said for a generic product, abuse of price is really not very much over cost price. If it's very much more than cost price, then that, that itself is going to tell you it's abusive. That's not consistent with most case law on abuse of pricing. That would really push things forward. But it wasn't a great facts case. I think anyone looking at that and looking at the documents that came out in particular about why it was being done, not a good facts case. Uh, CMA was challenged before the Competition Appeal Tribunal. Competition Tribunal, Appeal Tribunal said, all very well, it's a bad case. We should be applying the law, and the law doesn't say that that is an uh, excessive pricing. That's not the test for excessive pricing. Please, CMA, look at it again. CMA didn't say, fair enough, we'll look at it again and try and find a more, 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 more normal way of dealing with it. It has appealed before the Court of Appeal, and super helpfully, the judgment comes out on Monday. Uh, so I can't tell you what the judgment is going to be. I've not seen it, uh, and if I've seen it, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, but, but it, it, it feels like it'll go one of two ways. Does the Court of Appeal think, this is really bad conduct, we should be allowing this bad conduct to be taken out? So the bad facts piece, in which case the Court of Appeal may reinstate what the CMA did, or something along those lines. Or does the Court of Appeal take the view that this is important that we have the framework right, therefore we follow the Competition Appeal Tribunal and say, this needs to go back to be done properly, you can't short circuit just because it's a bad facts case, you can't short circuit the law. I would think and hope the Court of Appeal will do the latter, but we'll all find out on Monday, so I'm not going to predict more than that. Um, then there's a whole slew of other CMA investigations in this, and this is not a surprise. If you, if you do any Googling on this, you will find the NHS published long lists of these long-off patent products where there have been price spikes. So, so, so this has been known for years. These, the, the prices go up. Why are the prices going up? Because it's generic. Anyone can compete. Well, the problem with lots of generic competition is the price spirals down and down and down and down until it hits cost level, more or less. And then people say, well, I can produce this drug and make next to nothing on it, or I could produce some other drug and maybe make a bit more on it. So people start dropping out and dropping out. And then eventually one generic company looks around and says, no one else is making this drug. Let's put the price up. <laughs> like you would expect to happen in a competitive market. And what's the, what does the competitive market then say? Other people say, ooh, they're making money from that. That's a bit interesting. I'll start entering the market. And that's exactly what we do see, but that takes time. And in that time, the price goes up and up and up. And we've seen, a, seen that there was a, judge, a, a decision in the nortriptyline case today. This is the third one from the bottom. That came out this week. Uh, that was a product that was first marketed in 1963. Okay, so... Patents, IP, nothing to do with any of it. Um, last year, sorry, in 2018, the most recent figures we've got the NHS prescription data for, uh, the, the, the sales to the NHS were three and a half million pounds. On roughly the same volume in 2014 and 2015, it was 27 million and 32 million. For a very long off patent drug, where the price had shot up to that level. How did it shot up to that level? Well, what the CMA tells us is that it shot up to that level because there had been a cartel, there had been a conspiracy um, between the, the, the first player in the market who was pushing the price up and someone else who was coming on the market 
saying, okay, guys, you, 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 can, you can supply some of that, we'll supply some of this. So there'd been a, a, price agree, a price agreement that way. And then as more came onto the market, there'd been information sharing about what was happening and what was happening where. So, so removing uncertainty, removing competition from the market in that way. Um, and, and, and those are the t kind of two lines of attack to that kind of conduct. So, so one could say, a, a very kind of Chicago school competition lawyer would say, there's no problem here. This is precisely how the market should work. The price shoots up, that's a competitive signal for someone else to come in, they come in and sort it out. Uh, and these are little, just little bumps in the way. The NHS doesn't take the same view, saying suddenly, why the hell am I paying 30 million for something that should be costing me 3 million? There's something wrong here. What might be wrong here? Well, there may be a dominant position being abused, but that gets to difficult questions about what is excess pricing, and that's why the, the, the Pfizer-Flynn case matters so much, to find out what the test is for abusive pricing. Or, and the easier line of attack for the competition authorities is to say, well, that might be the case, but if you start entering into agreements with the people who are trying to come in, then you're playing with a competitive framework. And that is not dissimilar to the pay for delay, because it's, there's only one or two competitors at any one time, see if we can pay them off. That, that, that's, that's the legal theory. That is an easier legal theory to do um, if the facts support it. But that doesn't give you an answer in all circumstances, which I think is why we're seeing a push to try to get a 102 remedy in and a, an excessive pricing remedy in for these cases. But I think it's really important, particularly from an innovator side of the industry, these are nothing to do with innovators by and large. These are all drugs, but they very much get bundled together. I heard a very good competition lawyer talking about these cases earlier this week. And he described all these as pay for delay cases. And, and to some extent they are but they're nothing to do with patents, they're nothing to do with IP. So the problem that's arising in these price gouging cases is a market structural and regulatory problem, it is not an IP problem. And on that attempt at a positive note, I will wrap up and leave time for questions if there are allowed to be any.